which has penguins on it. It does indeed. Is, is there a significance to that, a yes. biological significance? Well, yes. I mean, th these are chin-strap penguins. Um, it's hand-painted by my wife, Lala Ward. Really? Um, as all my ties are. She paints ties. So this is a one-off tie. There's nothing else like it in the world. It's fabulous. Um, we went to Antarctica last mm -hmm. Christmas uh, on, a, on a cruise, and um, we spent Christmas on the boat in Antarctica. So this was my Christmas present, because we were seeing millions of penguins, and, and mm -hmm. this was a wonderful present to have. Do you have a particular interest in penguins? or is No, I love penguins. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're astonishing animals, the way they fly underwater. They look so clumsy on land, like clumsy little humans um, waddling along. Then they get underwater, and they're phenomenally fast. You wouldn't believe how, how quickly they can, they can swim through the water. The streamlining is beautiful. Uh, and so, like, like dolphins, they're astonishingly fast. And they do dolphining out of the water. They, they, they jump out of the water and then back in again in a, in a lovely dolphin-like way. Um, you, your first big success was The Selfish Gene, a book called The Selfish Gene, and then you wrote The God Delusion, um, which made you a rather controversial figure, but also, um, along with Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett, um, really made the word atheist acceptable. And um, I think before that people were ashamed to say they were an atheist or embarrassed or, I mean, and, and as, as you have pointed out before, you can't run for office in this country yes. uh, if you're an atheist yeah. or if you say you don't, yeah. you're not a believer. Yes. But I know that you, um, your, your autobiography, which this is part one of two parts, An Appetite for Wonder, you hardly mention religion in that. Why is that? Well, I'd given it a fairly good run for its money in The God Delusion. <laughs> um, the, I'd, I'd written about ten books between The Selfish Gene and The God Delusion, and uh, all of them about science, but the, the science that they're about is pretty much implies atheism, so it's kind of implied in them. In them. Um, this book is about my early life, uh, childhood, school days, university life, and then early research career. And uh, so I suppose I just wanted to tell the story of my life, in case anybody's interested. And um, there is a story of how I lost religious faith in there, but it doesn't dominate the book, nor should it. But do you find, um, I know wherever you go, and there are crowds and Q&A, and people always want to ask you questions about religion and the universe and why are we here and the meaning of life. Do you, are you tired of that? Are you tired no, of talking about No, because those questions are so important. And, and something you said just now about um, sort of making atheism respectable, I'm not quite sure that we did that exactly, but what I think we did do, and people tell me in the book signing cues, which, which are very gratifying, they tell me that uh, the God delusion um, gave them the courage to come out as atheists. They, in some cases it actually converted them, but in rather more cases they already were atheists, and it gave them the courage to come out, which suggests to me that there are a hell of a lot more atheists in this country than anybody realizes, and I think there may be a, a certain emperor's new clothes effect that, that nobody actually speaks out and says that they're an atheist, and yet if enough of them did, suddenly they all would. We'd get a kind of tipping point effect. You were talking about members of Congress and how out of all the 535 members of Congress there's only one person who claims to not be a believer. Do you believe that? Statistically it can't be true. Um, it's, it's, they've got to be at least at least 100, probably 200 members of Congress who are not religious believers. Um, if you just look statistically at, at um, the, the rest of the population, especially the educated population, which m many of them are. Um, so uh, there have got to be many, many, many Congress people who are, who are atheists, but they, they just don't want to talk about it because they think it'll lose them votes. And once again, I wonder whether there's an emperor's new clothes effect and whether they actually, if some of them tried it, they might be quite surprised that they wouldn't lose votes. They might even gain votes. Well, you were on the Capitol Hill yesterday with Steven Pinker, um and um, you met with a number of Senate staffers and then House staffers. Who 
came to listen to you all talk about secularism. What, why did they come, and what was that about? Well, we, I didn't ask them why they came, um, but they did come in, in quite substantial numbers, and they asked very interesting questions, and they seemed very enthusiastic. They, they, um, uh, we, we both talked, uh, one after the other. Uh, it was a very good meeting. It, was, it, it had a sort of feel of, of um, a, 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 a good atmosphere, a good enthusiastic atmosphere. Were they the kind of questions that you normally get on your tour, or were they more pointed? Were they political? I mean, do you think that they're trying to sort of figure out, can we really do this? Can no, we I, really I wish they were. I, I didn't get the feeling that they're exactly doing that. Um, but I think that they were interested in the issues that we, that we raised. Um, for example, the, the question of creationism in this country. It, it's an astonishing, a shocking fact, actually, that more than 40% of the people, yeah. if Gallup polls are to be believed, yeah. more than 40% of the people in this cu country believe that the, the world is less than 10,000 years old, which is <laughs> not just wrong, it's, it's, it's prodigiously wrong. I mean, because the true age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years, so 10,000, it's a tiny, tiny fraction. As, as I said before, it's equivalent to believing that the width of North America is eight yards. That's, that's the scale of the error. Um, and yet 40% of the American people believe it, um, and textbooks in Texas are, are tailored to, to, um, to cope with this extraordinary um, opinion of, of, of ignorant people. Well, you know, I, um, at, at the press club uh, where you were speaking, um, I, I sort of felt as though I were in the presence of the Dalai Lama or the Pope of atheism. I mean, you do have this incredible following. I mean, people were getting up and almost weeping and saying, you saved my life and I was going to become a nun until I read yes. your book, The God Delusion. Yes. I mean, how does well, that... Yes, I mean, I was both moved and slightly embarrassed. I, 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 I loved that, actually. But I, it, 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 any more, I mean, two, two of them in quick succession did that. Yes. Any more, one felt it was a bit like a sort of Billy Graham meeting where people didn't come <laughs> forward to be saved. That's right. Um, and I, well, I it, 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 yep. it did. It was reminiscent because yes. I've seen so many religious yes. leaders where people will get up yes. and say, "You saved my life," yes. and you know, yes. weeping and you know, yes. kissing their yeah. your penguin tie. Yes, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want. I don't want to foster that. But, but, but nevertheless, it is moving, and, and it's it's a reaction that I get. Um, I mean, a little bit more subdued than that, but the, re the reaction I often get, well, a, a majority of the people in my book signing queues say something similar to that, which is really very gratifying. Well, I mean, you can imagine, do you, does it go to your head? <laughs> I hope not. I don't think so. <laughs> well, you started out, you said there was very little that you were talking about about religion in your book, but um, can you tell me... I think you said you actually were quite religious when you were about 13. You became confirmed and, and you got into religion in a big way. And then when you were about 17 or 18, you became militantly anti-religion. Ex tell me about that. Well, I, I, was it um, the science that did yes, it for you? Yes, it's yeah. not unusual for a child to be religious. I mean, it, uh, my parents actually weren't, but. But nevertheless, um, my schools were, and I, I was confirmed, and everybody at the school was confirmed. I, mean, I think there was one boy who was sort of a Roman Catholic family, and, and, and he, he wasn't. Perhaps he was confirmed into the Roman Catholic Church, but all, all the rest of us were automatically confirmed into the Anglican Church. Um, so it wasn't a big decision on my part. I just kind of went, to, went with the flow. Uh, and then was pretty religious until the age of about 15 and then and then gave it up when I found that the the Darwinian alternative which really works as an explanation for the apparent design of living things I was I was a biologist I was very impressed with the apparent design of living things they look designed I mean you know penguins look beautifully designed for swimming very fast through the water uh, they're not designed they've evolved by natural selection and it took me until I was about 16 to really understand that properly, and then I gave up all semblance of religion. You know, it, when talking about sort of being the Dalai Lama, the Pope of atheism, um, I get the sense when I see you around other people that they're coming to you hoping to find the answers. And, um, you know, and of course you have talked about how one of the things that guides you most is 
that why, the existence of humans, why are we here, what's, what's the meaning of life. Um, do you ever feel somehow inadequate that you can't provide the answers they're looking for? It's, because it yeah. does have a, there is a certain messianic um, feeling about it. You know, the people will go to the Dalai Lama. I, I went to hear the Dalai Lama and I didn't understand a word he said, but people were weeping and, you know, yes. getting down on their knees and, you know. Um, and so I, it, 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 I don't mean to make it sound like that, you, but, but um, do you ever feel that somehow you should have the answers and you don't have the answers? These are not my answers. I mean, I, I, heaven forbid that I should be, be treated in this way. Um, these are not my answers. These are the answers of science, and I, mm. I, I uh, can can try to express the answers of science. The questions we're, we're talking about, these are the deep questions. Why are we here? What are we for? When did life start? Why did it start? All those sorts of questions. They're not my answers. These, these are the answers of standard science. And, and I've done my bit to try to, to explain them in, in really all, all my books. And so I try to do that. But heavens above, I'm not a messianic leader or anything like that. I, uh, one of my favorite uh, bumper stickers I once saw was, I don't know and you don't either. Uh, and I, I thought, in a way, you know, I guess you call yourself an atheist. Um, what does that mean to you? Well, I don't know and you don't either. I thoroughly approve of that, mm -hmm. especially if when I say you don't either, you're a religious person, because yeah. the, the, the great fallacy is to say science doesn't know, therefore religion must be right. And that, of course, is a total logical fallacy. There are plenty of things that we don't know. Mm -hmm. There are things that science doesn't know. But if science doesn't know something, there's absolutely no reason to think that religion does know it. We mustn't fall into the trap of thinking that there's a kind of religious default, which we default to when science can't provide the answer. Science is working on the answer. Science, in some cases, may never get the answer, but uh, that's absolutely no reason to think that therefore we default to the religious answer, certainly not. You, you, you talk about um, various different labels. There's atheist, there's agnostic, there are pantheist, there are deist. Uh, how do you define the difference in okay. those and, and what, what works for you? Okay. Um, well, uh, de deism is, is, as you know, the, the, the belief that no particular personal god, but just some kind of creative intelligence which set the whole clockwork running, set the universe going, and then retired and did nothing more. So doesn't forgive sins, doesn't listen to prayers, doesn't know what we think, has no interest in human affairs, just started the laws of physics going. That's deism. Um, theism is belief in some kind of personal god. Um, such as the Christian God, the, the Muslim God, um, the, the, the gods of Valhalla, the yeah, gods right, of right. Olympia, and so on. Um, pantheism, I've characterized as sexed up atheism. Um, it's sort of, it's kind of what Einstein be believed. He do, he, Einstein did not believe in any kind of personal God, but he had a kind of reverence for that which we don't yet understand. And some pantheists sort of feel there's a, as a kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to quite characterize exactly what, what, what pantheists uh, believe. Agnostics are people who don't know. That word was coined by Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's friend and colleague. Um, some people confuse agnosticism with thinking there's a kind of 50-50 toss-up, whether there's a god or not. Um, and there's really no reason to, to plump for 50-50. Um, in a sense, we're all agnostic because we can never actually disprove. We can't disprove leprechauns and, and, and pixies. Um, we have to be agnostic about them. But for all practical purposes, we are a leprechaunist and a pixieist and a fairyist. <laughs> um, and in the same way, um, we can be we can be atheists while technically ad admitting that we cannot actually disprove the existence of any particular god. So why wouldn't you call yourself a? Um an agnostic, then. I mean, well, I, I do sometimes call yeah. myself an agnostic, but I but I'm I'm a bit wary of that because people sometimes think that means a total non-commitment, mm -hmm. um, and 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 I'd rather say that I'm an I'm an atheist in the same sense as I'm an a tooth fairyist. Mm -hmm. Do you um, has your view changed of religion um, since you wrote the God Delusion? No. You and and you seem at uh, at least when the book came out, it seemed to me that you um, 
were m much more m militantly atheist than you are now. I mean, you, you seem to be have pulled back a little bit. No, I haven't pulled back. No. Um, actually, y you might be, if you reread The God Delusion, you might be quite surprised, actually. I think it's a bit of a myth that it's a militant book. Um, it's been assiduously criticized as a, as a militant book, and it's been called aggressive and strident and shrill and things like that. Um, I think if you read it again, you might think, oh, that's a, you know, I've actually ha had people say that to me, that they that they thought it was going to be a militant book because they'd read critics of it. And then, I mean, one woman told me that she uh, thought she'd better eventually get around to reading it because she'd heard it was such a militant, strident, shrill, mm -hmm. aggressive book. And she couldn't believe it was the same book because it was actually quite a gentle book. And the, 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 my latest book, the, the Appet an, an Appetite for Wonder, is a gentle book too. So I don't think I've pulled back. Mind you, this is not about religion, but I hope but, it comes across uh, this as a is a, book. an extremely gentle book. Mm. Um, I found anyway. Um, it's very cozy. Mm. <laughs> not too cozy, <laughs> but not too cozy. Yeah. But no, but it was it was very thoughtful and and um, it it um, it sort of belies the impression that some people have of yes. you that you are this sort of radical fundamentalist. Yes. Screamer yeah, and yeller. Yes. I don't. Uh, I don't shout. I'm no, not, no. Uh, there's, there's yes. no shouting in no. here at all. Um, but I, when you talk about pantheism, uh, deism, all of that, you have to look at science, and you say, okay, well, we can sort of trace it back to the Big Bang, the creation, or whatever it is, and then we don't know what happens after that. Before um, that, you mean? Hmm? Or before that, I mean. If, if we before do know means we, anything at all, right? Yes. Well, exactly. And then <laughs> you you've talked about nothingism. Yes. What does that mean? I mean, how can you put your mind around that? I mean, don't you lie awake at night because you say you don't like not understanding things, and yes. obviously your whole life yes. is about trying to understand things. Doesn't it make you crazy sometimes that you don't understand it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a physicist, and, and so I, I mean, I, I, I'm a biologist, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and so I, I know that the human brain was never evolved to understand uh, the mysteries of quantum theory, for example. Um, the human brain evolved to understand how to hunt antelopes on the African plains, and how to find water holes, and how to find a shelter for the night, uh, and how to find a mate. Um, the, these are all practical problems, and the human brain evolved to solve them. Very surprisingly and, and wonderfully, the human brain turns out to be capable of doing all sorts of other things, like poetry and music and logic and mathematics, and quantum theory. Not all of us, very few of us can do it, but um, th there are ph physicists who can uh, cope with this, these profundities, these difficulties of um, modern physics. It isn't easily compatible with common sense. Uh, the now, Big well, Bang... What do you mean? Well, the, the Big Bang and, and the, 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 the statement that physicists make, that time and space began at the Big Bang, there is no meaning to the word before. Well, I can't comprehend that. I don't think you can. Um, no. But that's no reason... And I'm reason not the number one thinker in the world, but that's, you are. That, oh, come on. <laughs> that's, that's, no reason to, um, that's no reason to retreat from it, because if you could do physics by common sense, we wouldn't need physicists. I mean, th there are difficulties here which common sense can't cope with, and, and some physicists say that, th that they are, when they actually try to understand it with their own subjective, intuitive feelings, they can't either. They can do the mathematics, and it works. Um, Lawrence Krauss, my colleague, uh, we did a film together called The Unbelievers, um, and he's written a book called A Universe from Nothing, and he produces physical, uh, th a physical theory, mathematically worked out, to show that you can get something from nothing, that, uh, no that nothing and nothing some, in some strange way cancel cancels itself out to produce something, and quantum theory allows that to happen. Well, um, I'm humble enough to say I don't understand it, and I'm not arrogant enough to say because I don't understand it, therefore it can't be right, as I said before. If we could do physics by 
common sense, we wouldn't need physicists. So what's hard to understand is if there is this creation um, and there was a creator or something, it was created, it, then who created the no, creator? No, the, what created well, the creator? And, and what they're saying is nothing. There was nothing. Yes, there was no need to talk about a creator. Yeah, that's just too hard to all. understand. Yes, yeah. it is. It's too, mm -hmm. it's, it's too hard to understand at a cognitive level mm -hmm. as an ordinary human common sense beings. Um, but the, the physical theory is there. Not all physicists accept it. They have a different theory. But um, uh, I think we have to admit that we're not all capable of grasping everything that the human mind has managed to grasp. Uh, and I'm excited to be in the company of physicists who do understand it. I mean, it was always clear to me that the origin of all things had to be very simple. Uh, because it's a hell of a lot easier to get something from, from some, from, to get complexity from simplicity by, I mean, I'm an evolutionist and that's what evolution does. Um, it, you can start with simplicity. I wasn't quite prepared to start with absolutely nothing, uh, but I sort of imagined that, it, that, that things started with, with, with great simplicity. Well, um, now I'm told by physicists you can start with absolutely nothing. Mind you, it's a little bit, um, exactly what you mean by nothing is, is, up for dispute. Um, no, I really can't do it. No, okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I can't either. Yes. Um, you obviously, you live and work in an, in an atmosphere of academia, and so you know a lot of very smart people. And um, you, some of them are religious. How, how, not many. <laughs> no, well, most scientists are not. Yes. I don't know what percentage. Maybe ten percent or five percent. Well, it of depends. It depends how you them. how you me how you measure it. Um, if you take all scientists working in the United States, polls suggest about um, forty percent are religious. If you take the elite scientists of the United States, who are members of the National Academy of Sciences, they've been elected as distinguished scientists. Then it's about ten percent are religious. But if you actually meet a scientist who claims to be religious and you ask what they really believe, uh, it, it's quite likely to turn out to be some sort of pantheism. Um, probably in, in many cases, I mean, in some cases it really is a personal God, it really is the Christian God or the, or the Jewish God. Uh, but quite often it is actually um, a pantheistic sort of Einsteinian religion, which is not really what I would call God belief at all. I know that you've done a number of debates, and um, when you're when you're in a debate with somebody who is a believer, believes in God, or even believes that Jesus is the Son of God, how, how do you can you respect somebody who believes that? I mean, do you think that they're stupid? No, I don't think. I mean, I, I always try to respect the individual people, uh, whether or not I respect their beliefs. And in the case of the of sort of bishops, I mean, people who are, who who are, who are Christian, but have sensible views of science, um, then I, I, I can even respect their, their beliefs. I can't respect the beliefs of young earth creationists. I mean, I could have to regard them as either ignorant or, or stupid. Um, but I, I hope I treat them with, with, with politeness. Um, Johan Hari, the British j journalist, said a rather nice thing. He said, I respect you as a person too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. <laughs> Is that rather nicely? <laughs> I think so. I mean, yes. Um, because your book is called An Appetite for Wonder, and also um, wonder often is what people who are religious or believers talk about, the transcendent, the, the wonder of the universe, the wonder of God, all of that. Can you separate those out? Of course, yes. Um, I think any good scientist is filled with wonder. Um, Einstein said it, Carl Sagan said it, uh, Great scientists are always filled with wonder. They, 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 they rely on their imagination. Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. Uh, so wonder, yes. Uh, and I think that scientists have probably a better handle on wonder than, than theologians. I mean, we are aware of the sheer wonder of the fact that the universe is gigantic, that time is gigantic, um, that life was produced by explicable phenomena working over a very, very long time, working on very simple beginnings, just the 
laws of chemistry, just molecules interacting with each other. And by this astonishing process called evolution by Darwinian natural selection, produced ever-increasing complexity of living creatures, including ourselves, including our brains, which are so complex and so large that they finally become capable of understanding the very process that gave rise to them. I mean, that is a wonderful thought. And who, 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 in any the, who among theologians could possibly match that for a wonderful, exhilarating thought? Let's talk about the sneeze. Right. <laughs> so you say that um, if Hitler's father had sneezed at a certain time, Hitler may not have been conceived. So would you explain what you mean yes, by that? Yes, I mean, I, I wanted to make the point that, we, that our existence, every one of our existences, hangs by a thread of quite astonishing luck. And so um, I chose Hitler because if Hitler hadn't lived, then the whole history of the 20th century yeah. would, have, would have been different. Um, Hitler's father, his name wasn't Hitler, it was Schickelgruber. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Heil Schickelgruber. Yeah. Um, if, if Herr Schickelgruber... Uh, had not, sn I mean, I, I, of course I don't know when, when, when he sneezed. What I'm saying is that a sneeze 20 years before Hitler was born would have been enough to change circumstances, knock on effects, such that... Why? The, I mean, explain well, why okay, the sneeze. I mean, Hitler came into existence because of a particular sperm out of millions happened to hit a particular egg at a particular time. Now, um, Aldous Huxley expressed that rather elegantly in, in his poem, which went, a million million spermatozoa, all of them alive, out of their cataclysm but one poor Noah dare hope to survive. <laughs> and of that billion minus one might have chanced to be Shakespeare, another Newton, a new Dunn, but the one was me. Shame to have ousted your betters thus, taking ark while the others remained outside. Better for all of us, fro at homunculus, if you'd quietly die. <laughs> well, we but all of us have that. Explain the sneeze. What, okay. the, what the sneeze has to do with right. it. Um, never mind the sneeze. I mean, just the, the moment of conception of any one of us. A million, million spermatozoa. The exact timing of the, of the act of copulation which gave rise to each one of us would have totally changed which of a million, million sperms hit the jackpot on that particular occasion. Now, a sneeze immediately before the conception could clearly have that effect. It would simply change the timing. Um, a sneeze 20 years earlier would change the timing of uh, when Herr Schickelgruber happened to um, get on a bus to Berlin, or, or he caught this bus rather than that bus. I mean, there's a whole knock-on series of effects uh, which um, with, by, by a route, by a circuitous route, which we can't possibly reconstruct, would nevertheless have, have determined, have changed which of many sperms happened to work, not just in Hitler's own generation, of course, in, in, in every generation that you can think of, you and me and our parents and our grandparents and our, our, our great-grandparents, we none of us have any right, have any entitlement to be alive, yet we are. With hindsight, somebody had to be alive, and it happens to, 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 to be us. I mean, I expressed this in the opening sentences of an, another of my books, Un Unweaving the Rainbow. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. We're astonishingly lucky to have been born. Um, I've said in another way, in another part of the book, if the second dinosaur to the left of the third of the tall cycad tree hadn't happened to sneeze, he would have caught the little shrew-like animal at his feet, which was destined to give rise to all the mammals. And all the mammals are descended from one creature that lived, I don't know, let's say in the Jurassic era. And that one creature that we're all descended from, every single mammal is descended from this one creature, could so easily have been eaten by a dinosaur before it reproduced. Um, and I'm speculating, I'm conjecturing that something as trivial as a sneeze by a dinosaur saved the life of that one mammal and therefore saved the life, I mean made possible the life of every mammal including ourselves. You've used the word luck several times in the last few minutes. 
and luck sounds a little bit like fate. Um, it, it doesn't sound very scientific. Ah, well, the mistake is to use luck in a sort of predictive way, to say something like certain people are lucky. Um, you say, um, somebody is a very lucky person. If, 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 by, I mean, if, if all you mean is that they've had a lot of luck, that's fine. But if you mean that they are prone to luck, if you mean you can predict... I mean, the most extreme example of this I've talked about is um, in, in a cricket match, it's probably the same in baseball matches and things as well, who bats first is determined by the toss of a coin. Uh, and it may matter who bats first, it certainly does in cricket, it matters a lot. And some people actually believe, I mean, the, the two captains, they toss a coin and one of the captains calls heads or tails. Some people actually believe that some individuals are more lucky at getting, get, getting the, the call of a toss than, than others. And they actually may even choose a player as captain because they think he's more likely to win the toss. So they believe that some people are lucky people. That is total nonsense. Um, so that's the sense in which it's unscientific to talk about luck. But it's not unscientific to say so-and-so is very lucky because she had a whole series of good things happen to her by, by, by luck, by chance. Um, and nor is it wrong to say that we're all lucky to be alive because uh, a sneeze at any time in the past would probably have meant that we would not be alive. It still sounds like luck to me. I mean, is there a lucky gene? No! No, 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 no. no. <laughs> No, but we're, you. We're, I mean, talking, you... I'm talking with hindsight. Yeah, you, you can talk right. about luck with hindsight. What you mustn't do is talk about luck with foresight or say, um, "I feel luck's with me tonight. I feel lucky tonight. I'm going to go and play roulette at Las Vegas because I feel lucky tonight," um, or "I have a lucky number," um, or uh, "the the roulette spin has come up with red five times in a row." So uh, the, the the luck suggests that it ought to. To, I mean, you could either say it's likely to go on being red, or, or it's, it's about time it changed to black, um, because it's black's turn. I mean, either of those are the so-called gambler's fallacy. Um, but look at you. I mean, you're an incredibly lucky person. I mean, you had a wonderful, happy childhood. You had a great education. You had a fantastic career. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've had an, an amazing life. And then we look at some of the people who've just been gassed in Syria or the people who are starving in Africa, or the people who are being stoned for adultery somewhere, or whatever cat natural catastrophe. Um, how do we explain that? I mean, this is, this is from an atheist point of view. Uh, obviously, it's one of the most obvious questions to ask a religious person, how do you explain suffering if there's a loving God? But from an atheist point of view, how do we explain that you get to have such a fabulous life and someone else is is not lucky to have been born. Well, so far I've been talking about talking about luck with hindsight. Right. And, and so that's, that's um, you, you can say that if somebody um, tosses coins and, and it comes up heads often, or if somebody's lucky at, at roulette, um, that's luck with hindsight. That's pure hindsight. Absolutely everything. That's nothing to do with it, with anything, to, any ability. It's pure hindsight. Um, when you say somebody has had a very, a very fortunate life, um, that's not necess That's not just with hindsight. I mean, le leave me out of it. But but people who are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, people who 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 are we wealthy parents, have a good education, have good genes, um, uh, get a get. Um, get a good job because of, their, because of their, their, their abilities and they go on and make a thorough success of their life. Um, I wouldn't use the word luck for that. I mean, I would say that this is various things favoured them, their genes, their upbringing, their education, their parents, the fact that they were brought up in a home lined with books like this studio. Um, uh, you don't want to attribute that to chance, to luck. That's, that's a set of circumstances. They were well endowed. Um, in all sorts of, of of senses, that's not mysterious. Well, uh, I find it mysterious. I mean, I, I I find that so if you look at the the division between rich and poor and the people who suffer and the people who don't, um, it's mysterious why 
why me? Well, you why think do that I get to have a good yes. life and somebody yeah. else, is, you know, no, I mean, loses all their children in, in a massacre? But this is because this is because you sort of feel there ought to be some kind of natural justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you feel you feel it's somehow wrong that somebody should should have all this good fortune and and and, and others not. And if there were natural justice, it wouldn't happen. And and certain societies do their best to, um, to as it were, redistribute. Uh, the, the good fortune. Countries like the Scandinavian countries that have high tax rates and take a lot from the rich and give to the poor. Um, I mean, things like Obamacare is trying to do in a very, very small way. Um, uh, this is trying to achieve a certain amount of natural ju of, of, of justice, of redistributive justice. Um, and you, you are protesting when you say some people have a charmed good life and other people um, end up being gassed in, in Syria. That's of course terrible. Other people are poor. Some are rich. Some are, some are poor. Um, your 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 sense of justice uh, rebels against that because you feel somehow it's wrong. Um, but it's the it's the way things happen. You can do something about it. You can say let's reform our society in such a way that we do redistribute the good fortune a bit. But there's no natural justice. The universe doesn't owe poor people the same living as as rich people. It's just the way things happen to turn out. When, when people say something like, um, if somebody gets a terrible disease, gets terrible cancer, painful cancer or something, says, why me? Why did it happen to me? I didn't ever do anything wrong. I, I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. Why me? It's a total fallacy to think that because you're a good person, therefore bad things shouldn't happen to you. Or you're a bad person and you have a perfect health. Again, no natural justice. There isn't any natural justice. That's one of the points. So you mentioned earlier that if you have good genes, so what does that mean to have good genes? Well, your genes affect all sorts of things like your health, your ability to do, to do things, your mental ability, your physical ability. That's what natural selection is all about, the choice of good genes um, to survive, genes that help you to survive. And um, in the wild, uh, all animals are um, subject to natural selection which means that the genes that make them good at surviving, because it gives them good eyesight, good ears, good, good um, claws, good teeth, good running limbs, good wings to fly with, um, those, are all, those all represent good genes. And it's the good genes that survive to the next generation, and then the next, and then the next. So genes are very important in endowing an individual of any species with the ability to not just survive, but to do all sorts of other things. So some people undoubtedly will be endowed with better genes than others. People may die because they have genetic diseases. Other people are endowed with genes that make them live a, a long, healthy life. Well, one of the things you said in the book which fascinated me was the fact that people, um, that essentially we all come from the same gene, that we're all genes, that we're all related on some level, starting at what point. And um, and then, but then you say that if if you go three or four generations along, the person in the last generation probably won't have very much genetic. From no, that's right. Sameness. Yes. As the person. If, will you explain that? Yes. Um, if you want to ask the question, um, how long ago did we share a common ancestor? The answer is probably not very far. Um, we've got, each one of us has got two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 and so on. Um, that exponential increase in ancestors can't go on, because if it did, if you, if you actually calculate how many people there would have to have been, say, um, in the time of William the Conqueror, the t 1066, um, just for my ancestors, it would be more than the population of the world at the time. And we do the same for yours and the same for, for everybody else's. So obviously, we all share an ancestors. If you look at it the other, other way around, um, you don't have to go back very far until you reach a point where, um, just simply on mathematical grounds, if you, if, if you imagine that we're all living on an island and all um, reproducing sort of at random, we don't divide it into separate groups at all li living together, you'd only have to go back a few thousand years for everybody in the world to be descended from the same common ancestor.
So we're related. Oh, of course we are. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I mean, you and I are very closely related. Yeah. Um, we probably only have to go back a few hundred years. Mm. Um, have you had your DNA test? I have, as a matter of fact. Really? Yes, and yes. What, what, did it, what did you find? Well, there's, it, I mean, it's a bit of a game so far because, because not a hell of a lot is known about what most of the genes are. Are, d are doing. Mm. Um, the, the most interesting genes to look at are probably the um, mitochondrial genes because they are ones that go down the female line only. So all males have them but we get them from our mother. So the mitochondrial DNA, little, little things in the cell called mitochondria have their own DNA, they're actually originally bacteria. Um, so I got it from my mother, from her mother, my maternal grandmother, my maternal maternal great grandmother, my maternal 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 great great grandmother, and so on. So this is a narrow trickle of genes down one side of the family tree, but there are all other possible ways in which you could have got genes. So um, this makes mitochondrial DNA very easy to trace because it's not constantly being swamped by sexual reproduction. It doesn't recombine with other genes. So we know. Um, when our most recent common ancestor in the female line lived um, and she lived in Africa uh, maybe a couple of hundred thousand years ago she's called mitochondrial Eve the sort of journalistic name being given mm -hmm. to her but um, people of European descent can trace that their ancestry to, back to a much more recent female female uh, common ancestor but remember that, that the female 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 one is only one way of doing it there are all sorts of other ways in which you could trace your ancestry. You could go female, male, female, male, female, male, 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 female, female. Um, and there are millions of other ways in which you can trace ancestry. And if you do it that way, you and I will turn out to be a common... Will ha will, you and I will turn out to have a common ancestor much, much more recently than, uh, than mitochondrial Eve. So, so yeah. we're all cousins. We're all relatively close cousins. Um, go back a bit further and we're all cousins of monkeys and chimpanzees and kangaroos and wombats and, and, and jellyfish. So have you ever done Ancestry.com? Have you ever traced uh, your ancestry? No, I don't think I have, but, it, but you can do that. I mean, it, it, using either Y chromosome, which is the male equivalent, that goes down the male line only. Females don't have that, but you can do it by getting your father or your brother. Um, uh, so either, either Y chromosome DNA or mitochondrial DNA enables you to find where your mitochondria and your, and your Y chromosome comes from. It doesn't tell you where the rest of your genes come from. I mean, there was a, a television program on uh, British television which rather foolishly, I think, um, took people and traced their mitochondria. They, they took actually um, people, descendants of slaves from Jamaica, and they had one woman who traced her mitochondria back to a particular tribe in West Africa, which was nice, I mean, quite an interesting thing to do. And they then took her to this tribe in West Africa. And the great sort of weeping, oh, my people, my people. Um, it's nonsense. I, I mean, it's, I saw it's that only the mitochondria. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, the rest of her genes could have come from absolutely anywhere. Mm -hmm. Probably came from Russia and, mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make you weepy to think. That Shouldn't make you weepy. No, <laughs> it's it's sort of interesting. Cousins um, out there. But but the, perhaps the the more weepy message is we are all cousins. We're all fairly close cousins. Um, we are closely related to each other. Um, you invented the word meme, which is now very much a part of the language and I think you said uh, some 30 books have been written with the word Did I? Yes. Okay. meme yes, in it. I think it's true. How, wh what does meme mean and how did you come to conceive of that word? It's a unit of cultural inheritance and uh, I, I think of it as the cultural equivalent of a gene. Um, the reason I wanted to coin the word was that it came at the end of my first book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, and the, the rest of the book is all about DNA being the unit of natural selection. So as I said a moment ago, um, the genes that are successful are the ones that survive through, through gene pools. And so the whole um, effort of writing the selfish gene was to emphasize the gene as the unit of selection, that which, which benefits from an animal's behavior, for example. The survival of the genes is what animal behavior is all about. But I wanted to not leave the reader with the impression that genes are everything. I wanted to leave the reader realizing that natural selection could work on anything 
which is self-copying, anything where, there is, where information is copied through something equivalent to generations. DNA is the most important example, but something that's imitated from human brain to human brain, um, a clothes fashion, a way of speaking, uh, um, a tune. Uh, use, use the word in a, in a sentence. Um, the reverse baseball cap is a meme that has spread from America in youth culture all over the world. You said it came from the French word mem, which means same. Well, you can, you can relate it to the French word mem. I actually got it from a Greek word, my meme. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I subtracted the initial mi and just called it meme. I wanted something that ideally should have rhymed with gene, but it doesn't quite rhyme with gene. It's a sort of. Um, yeah. But it, it's sort of an imitation of something? Imitation. Mm -hmm. Imitation is the key. Um, DNA could be said to be imitated when it mm -hmm. self-replicates. Self um, if I sing you a tune um, and you get the tune in your head, it, it's a catchy tune. You, you catch it and then you go out into the street and you find yourself whistling it. You've changed the medium from voice to whistling. It doesn't matter. Somebody else hears you whistling it and they pick it up and they sing it, and somebody else hears it, and they sing it, and somebody else hears it, and they, and they whistle it. It can potentially spread like an epidemic. Um, a craze at school, a craze for a particular toy, a particular game, um, spreads through the school like a measles epidemic. Uh, and it has much the same epidemiological time course as a measles epidemic. It rises and then it dies away. Um, then it may jump to another school because somebody knows somebody, a brother or something, a sister at, an, at another school. Um, so that's a meme. It's like a gene. It's like a virus. It's like a mind virus. So if people suddenly started wearing penguin ties, exactly. that would be exactly. a meme. If, yeah. if, if people saw my penguin tie on, on the C-SPAN, <laughs> they said, I must have a penguin tie too. Um, Your wife spread. could get rich. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, you, you, you'd call it a, a, a meme if it spreads by, um, by imitation. It wouldn't have to be exactly the same penguin tie. It can be, um, so long as it's recognizably inherited from, from a sequence of generations, then you can call it a meme. Um, you've got two more years to go to finish the part two of your uh, memoirs. What, why did you decide, you're 72 now, right? Why did you decide suddenly to write your memoirs at this point? Why not another sort of scientific book? Well, um, the publishers are very keen that I should. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I just missed, my father died just before I started, so I, I, I wasn't able to consult him about past memories. Um, I was able to consult my mother, who is 96, and that was very valuable, very useful to me. Um, it seemed a good idea to do it while I was still around. As well. <laughs> <laughs> You're counting down the days, are you? Well, I, not round that. As for why it's two volumes, um, um, I mean, I, it was supposed to be one volume. I actually signed a contract for, for for the whole book, and then when I got halfway through, I sort of felt the need for a bit of a sense of achievement, and 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 it seemed like it, it was actually quite a natural break point. Uh, the the publication of my first book. Um, was a sort of watershed event in my life because my life did rather change after that and then I wrote a whole lot more books and did things like television and radio and journalism and things so it's a pretty natural break point. So when you finish your next book I mean obviously that's going to occupy your time for the next couple of years and then the endless book tour um, do you do you have a bucket list? Um, well um, there are parts of the world I haven't yet seen, um, and um, other parts I have seen and would like to see again. I mean, I love New well, Zealand. Like well, New Zealand is a wonderful, fabulous place. I'd love to go back there. Um, Australia, I've seen very little of South America. Um, I haven't seen China at all. Um, I've seen Antarctica. I haven't seen the Arctic. Um, so yes, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. Um, I've also got other books that I'd quite like to write as well. Any novels? Well, I don't know. I've never sort of quite known how to do that. Um, you just make things up. It's very yes, different know, from it's very you, different from what you but do. But you have to do dialogue. I mean, how do you? Is that easy? Um, well, I've written a couple of novels. I know. Um, um, well, I 
I talk a lot, so <laughs> I don't find it that hard. But I, I do quite fancy the idea of, I mean, I, I rather like satirical novels that are kind of close observation of the way people talk and the way people are. Um, some, uh, for some reason, whenever I'm in airports listening to the tannoy and listening to people around me, I sort of feel I should write a novel. I'm, uh, I sort of, you know, hearing, hearing the way people talk. Do you read them? Yes, I mean, I'll say I read, I like, um, I like modern satirical novels. I, li I like Kingsley Amis, Evelyn Waugh, um, Michael Frayn, um, that, that kind of, uh, David Lodge, that, 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 that sort of um, um, perceptive, witty look at, at contemporary life. I like science fiction too. One of the things that I loved in your book was you said that when you were much younger that one of your favorite books was Gone with the Wind and you read it a number of times. What was it about it's terribly Gone with racist. I mean, I, I didn't realize when, <laughs> no, I, was, well, when but, I was young. But the story itself, what was yes. it about Gone with the Wind that intrigued? I, I must have read it ten times. I'm not sure I would like it now, actually. <laughs> I, I liked it as a child. Um, yeah, it carries you along. Uh, well, is... LSD, taking LSD maybe on your On bucket my bucket list. list. Well, you know, well, you did yeah. mention in your book that someone had recently offered to yes. take you on a trip yes. and um, that you had turned them down. Well, Why did you turn them down? Well, there's a chapter in, in my memoir about my time in Berkeley, um, mm -hmm. which was the late right. 60s, and you might think I would have tried it then, but nobody ever offered it to me at that did time. Did you ever do marijuana? When no, you, did no, not even that. Nothing? No, nothing. Um, Never done any drugs at all. Oh, later yeah. uh, mar marijuana, but uh, but mm -hmm. but, ne but never a hallucinogen like uh, mm -hmm. like LSD or mescaline. Um, and um, recently, a friend offered to mentor me through an LSD trip, and she said she'd take a half dose to so <laughs> that she was sort of empathising, but but still capable of making sure I didn't jump out of the window thinking I could fly or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I couldn't decide whether to do it. I, I, um, I have a cousin, my, my father's first cousin, um, who's mentioned in the book, is an expert on, on such dr drugs. And um, I mean, for, as, as a pharmacologist, as a, as a psychiatrist, indeed, um, he it was, I think, who um, influenced Aldous Huxley to, to do his famous experiment, um, oh, taking, yeah, yeah. taking mescaline. Um, so I wrote and asked him whether he would advise it. He gave very balanced opinion. He said, on the whole, not. Why? Uh, because of the dangers of a bad trip. Uh, and, um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can guard against that. Maybe take a lower dose or something and, and guard against it or, or but it make did, sure the ambiance is right so that it doesn't happen. But it did intrigue you, the idea of it? It definitely intrigues me, yes. Yes, because I'm reading descriptions, not just Aldous Huxley's, but various other um, descriptions of well, Huxley's phrase, the doors of perception were clen cleansed, um, which I think is a quote from something else. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I would be very curious uh, to try. He, you said he was a psychiatrist. Have you ever been to a psychiatrist? Not as a, no, 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 I haven't. Do you, how do you feel about psychiatry or therapy? I'm sure it's a very important thing for, for, for some people. I, I feel perhaps very fortunate that I don't think I've needed. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, yeah, I'm interested in the, the sort of um, confluence between religion and psychiatry. That, uh -huh. that so many yes. people who, well, that the psychiatrist often plays the role that the, the priest plays. Yes. And um, we've talked before about the idea of, um, of good and evil and um, good genes and evil genes and what makes a person good and what makes them a moral person. Um, and I think sometimes when you see a psychiatrist or you see a, talk to a priest or whatever, you, you're trying to bring out the best of yourself. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely p part, isn't there, in um, Crocodile Dundee, where Crocodile D Dundee is told that um, just about everybody in New York goes to a, goes to a psychiatrist and he says, What's the matter? Have they got any mates? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't remember that. Yeah, that's a nice one. But there, there, um, there is some similarity there, and I think that I think most people, if you ask them, would say that they want to be good and moral. And we've, as I said, we've talked about this before. But um, 
how do you define morality? And do you think that um, often people will say, well, you can't really be moral if you are not religious, yes. if you don't believe in a God. Where do we get morality? And do we have a moral gene? Where do we get well, the there, notion there, of... Yeah, there, there are people, people who think you, you, you can't define what you mean by morality. I, I think we, we do define it. It's, a mat it's, cl it's, it's, it's clearly true that at any particular time in history, a particular society at least, uh, for example, modern Western society, American Western European society and so on, um, in the 21st century has a very distinctive 21st century morality which we all share whether we're religious or not. And it's a kind of consensus that we, uh, we accept. Um, it's somewhat based on the golden rule, do as you would be done by, um, treat others as you would wish them to treat you. Um, and do you go by the golden rule? Yes, certainly. By the golden yes, certainly. Yeah. And, I mean, we all, um, to a greater or lesser extent, um, subscribe to the sort of feeling that we, we kind of together try to decide what kind of society we want to live in. We want to live in the sort of society where people don't steal, um, where they don't kill, they don't, they don't rape, they don't um, g commit grievous bodily harm, they pay taxes. Um, we've, we take care of the poor, the sick, the elderly. Um, we, we, we live in a society which cares for each other, which cares for other sentient beings indeed. Um, and we can sort of work out for ourselves that this is the kind of society in which we wish to live. Um, I, without any religious belief, would not wish to live in the kind of society where people cheat, where they don't pay their taxes, where they, where they rape and steal and kill. Um, and I suppose you could say it's, it's a kind of redirected selfishness because you don't want that to happen to you. Uh, so you want to live in a well-ordered society which, where you're protected from that. Um, what actually counts as a well-ordered good society varies from century to century. Uh, in the 19th century, um, British and presumably American society was highly sexist. Uh, you couldn't vote, women couldn't vote in America until the 1920s, nor in Britain, nor in most of Western Europe. Um, so we've moved on, and we've moved on as a whole society, collectively. Some kind of collective zeitgeist has moved on. Uh, we've abandoned that kind of sexism which said women are not, not capable of voting because they can't think. Um, I mean, barbarous things as we would now see it. But yet in the 19th century, um, Thomas Henry Huxley, Charles Darwin, Abraham Lincoln, um, these men were all enlightened for their time, but they would be regarded as extremely backward for our time. And so there is a kind of shifting zeitgeist which clearly has nothing to do with religion. It's, what it has to do with is complicated, but, but it moves on. And do you think at some point in our lives we will not be a religious society? Yes, I think I do think that. Uh, it may take a while. Um, it's, we're moving in the right direction, in, certainly in Europe, and I think also in America, actually. I mean, the number of, the number of people who profess no religion in America has now exceeded 20%. That's a fifth. That's quite a large percentage. It's a percentage that hasn't been really recognized politically, but it's there. Uh, in, in Europe, it's much higher, most of Europe. I mean, not all, not, not, not Poland, for example, but in Britain and Scandinavia and Holland and so on, it's, it is. And a lot of that may actually have been because of you and your book, The God Delusion. Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> to think that? I, I wouldn't <laughs> dare say that myself.